Preface and Chapter One of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand, a record of the first exploration of the chief glaciers and ranges of the Southern Alps. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Co. NZ. Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand. A record of the first exploration of the chief glaciers and ranges of the Southern Alps by Arthur Paul Harper. Preface and Chapter One. In the years 1889, 1890, 1891, 1892, I made holiday expeditions to the Tasman district of the Southern Alps, and in 1893, 1894, 1895, was employed by the New Zealand government to explore the valleys and glaciers of the west coast of the South Island i do not pretend to have made many high ascents but base my claim to be considered an authority on the alps of new zealand on the fact that i have shared in the first exploration of nearly every glacier in the central position of these mountains it is not right in my opinion for one who has special knowledge on a subject of general interest to keep that knowledge to himself and for this reason as well as with the object of recording our work and helping others by our experiences I have ventured to write the following pages. The work of map-making and topographical exploration is sometimes undervalued, and a man's capabilities and exploits too often estimated by the number of high ascents made and new routes discovered by him, without considering the usefulness of the results. It is impossible to map the country without a vast deal of hard and more or less monotonous work, and those who in after years make use of the maps are apt to forget this we too frequently find climbers ignoring those who have preceded them and whose work has materially helped them some even attempt to add to their own exploits by omitting to acknowledge their predecessors work this is especially the case in the opening up of a country that is little known and it is therefore right that a record of the first explorations should be made i have in the following pages recorded all the pioneer work which has materially contributed to the present topographical knowledge of the central portion of the southern alps not having studied any of the standard books on glacier science my theories and conclusions are the results of the observations of several years and i may have dwelt unnecessarily on points which are well known to those who are authorities on the subject of adventures we had of course enough to satisfy any ordinary human beings but they were so bound up with the work that we were apt to take them as a matter of course i have however in recording our progress described a sufficient number to convey an idea of the conditions under which the work had to be carried out if the life was rough i fear my account of it is rougher but hope that the facts here set down may be none the less interesting because they appear in somewhat crude language should any fellow member of the alpine club decide to come and climb our peaks i shall be only too glad to give him all the information in my power and trust that he will take this offer seriously and write to me should he need advice the map published in this volume has already appeared excepting a few additional details which i have since added in mr e a fitzgerald's publication before leaving the survey office in hokitika i helped the draughtsman to record the results of mr douglas's and my work on the map at mr fitzgerald's request in order that the tracing which was sent to him might be quote, up to date end quote for though the last of the unexplored country had been mapped by us before his arrival in new zealand it had not been transferred to the standard map arthur p harper january eighteen ninety six note it is considered desirable to state that the letter announcing the transmission of the manuscript of mr harper's book is dated christchurch new zealand march eighteen eighteen ninety six the manuscript was received in england on may eighteenth t fisher unwin End of note. Chapter 1. Introductory Remarks on the Southern Alps and Climbing in New Zealand The main features of the mountain system of the South Island of New Zealand are tolerably well known, and need only be generally referred to here. Beginning at the north end of the South Island, we find, in Nelson and Marlborough provinces, numerous ranges spreading from coast to coast, and reaching in some instances an altitude of 9,000 feet amongst these hills very little flat land is to be found though there is a vast area of low undulating grass and forest country well fitted for pastoral purposes though no glaciers exist in this part of the island there are many grand peaks on which snow is found during most of the year while the lower spurs are often clothed 
with luxuriant forest of which a considerable area has been cleared and opened up for settlement further south these ranges draw together till in the southern alps they form a great mountain wall running from northeast to southwest which sends off a number of spurs rising into bold ice-clad peaks and for upwards of one hundred miles presents a snowy barrier between the west and east coast districts to the eastward the southern alps send out great buttresses or offshoots terminating suddenly in the broad canterbury and mackenzie plains which form by their absolute flatness and vast extent a striking contrast to the peaks behind to the westward they slope rapidly and in many cases fall in sheer precipices for some thousands of feet to the coast leaving about ten miles of comparatively level country between them and the sea until the sounds of otago are reached here in the province of otago the chain spreads out again from coast to coast in lower hills amongst which are flourishing farms and sheep stations on the eastern side of the island while on the westward side the mountains rise abruptly out of the sea to a great height amongst the otago hills lie the beautiful lakes of wakatipu tianao wanaka etc which are backed by mounts aspiring Ernslow and other fine alpine peaks reaching in some instances over nine thousand feet as the subject matter of this book is confined to the central portion of the southern alps amongst the larger glaciers and highest peaks a short description of the general topography of the mountains to the north and south of that district will be sufficient between christchurch on the east coast and hokitika on the west coast a coach road unsurpassed by any i have seen elsewhere runs over arthur's pass at an altitude of a little over three thousand feet a railway presenting some formidable engineering difficulties is now in course of construction by this route for some distances south of arthur's pass the southern alps only rise above the snow line in the peaks there being many passes free from snow in the summer many fine glaciers exist however at the head of the waimakariri river which rises near the pass and flows eastward south of this river is the rakaia which makes its rise from the glaciers on the main range and those of mount aerosmith and the surrounding peaks the chief sources being the ramsey and lyle glaciers both of considerable size the latter at present is practically unexplored the peaks in this locality are very fine the chief one mount aerosmith nine thousand one hundred and seventy one feet being an offshoot of the main range and forming a splendid group of rock peaks comparatively little beyond general information is known of this locality from an alpine point of view only one or two parties have been there for short visits but it is easily accessible as there are sheep stations and homesteads within easy reach of the chief points of interest note new zealand alpine journal volume one page one hundred and forty two end of note alpine passes ought to be found over the dividing range without difficulty at this point and no doubt before long we shall have more accurate and detailed knowledge of what ought to prove a very interesting district the only record of a transalpine pass in this district is that made by mr g j roberts and his survey party in the seventies when he ascended a branch of the wanganui river on the west coast and reached the watershed afterwards the same party having come round by coach to canterbury carried their triangulation up the rakaia river and joined the west and east coast surveys ascending to the same point on the divide thus proving a pass practicable south of the rakaia the rangitata river flows from two or three glaciers of more or less second-rate importance as compared with other alpine districts note new zealand alpine journal volume one page twenty two end of note here again we find some fine peaks lying on spurs of the main range the highest peak in this district is mount tyndall on the divide itself but practically unknown as indeed is the whole of this district above the snow line the next and last river flowing to the east coast which need be mentioned is the waitaki river one of the largest in the south island its two main branches take their rise from the chief glaciers on the eastern slopes of the main range the northern branch comes from the classen and godley glaciers under the name of the godley river flowing into lake tekapo and leaves it as the Tekapo River, till it unites with the Pukaki River. The main or central branch comes from the four great glaciers, the Murchison, Tasman Hooker, and Muller, and flows for thirty miles under the name of Tasman River into Lake Pukaki, and thence continues as the Pukaki River, until it is joined by the Tekapo River, the two forming, with other more southerly tributaries, the great Waitaki River. 
my personal explorations on the eastern slopes of the southern alps have been confined to the headwaters and glaciers of the central branch of this river and i shall give more detailed information of that district in a later chapter the western slopes and offshoots of the main range are very precipitous and the rivers though of considerable size are comparatively short and descending very rapidly have cut deep impassable gorges through the mountains unlike the eastern slopes which are nearly all open tussocky grass-covered country the west coast ranges are covered with dense forest to a height of three thousand five hundred feet to four thousand feet beginning at arthur's pass on the western side the first river south is the hokitika which takes its rise from small glaciers on the dividing range and corresponds to the Rakaia and Waimakariri on the east. Some thirty miles farther south is the Wanganui River, which drains a large part of the main range, and has four or five large branches, at the head of which are glaciers of second-rate size. This river has never been explored, except the one branch up which Mr. Roberts went in the seventies, and I believe that it heads the southern tributaries of the Rakaia River and part of the Rangitata. About twenty miles further down the coast is the Wataroa, another large river draining the main range at the head of the rangitata godley and murchison glaciers it also has many large branches in the mountains up which no doubt there are considerable snowfields and some fair-sized glaciers but except the tributary coming from the Seely pass at the head of the godley glacier it may be said to be terra incognita some fifteen miles below the wataroa is the waiho which takes its rise from some magnificent glaciers namely the burton spencer and Franz Joseph, from the head of which saddles lead into the upper portion of the Tasman Glacier. Still travelling south along the beach, we come to Cook River, some twenty miles below the Waiho. This river has three branches, and draws its supplies from the Fox, the Balfour, and La Perouse glaciers, all of first-class importance. Though these streams flow into the sea some distance apart, they are all closely connected in the ranges, separated only by narrow ridges, over which passes could easily be made below cook river the karangarua river flows into the sea at a distance of some six miles it also takes its rise from large glaciers and has three branches the copeland river from the strontian and marchant glaciers the twain river from the horace walker douglas and fitzgerald glaciers and the main branch from no particular ice field but draining the northern end of the hooker range these last three rivers the waiho cook and karangarua draw their supplies from the highest and most important part of the southern alps and correspond with the tasman river on the eastern side at the head of the karangarua a saddle leads into the landsborough river which takes its rise from four or five first-class glaciers and flows southward along the foot of the main range for forty miles on its right bank the hooker range a large and important offshoot of the main range prevents it from finding a direct course to the sea after flowing for forty miles between these two mountain chains, the river takes a sweep round to the west and finds its way to the Tasman Ocean at a point sixty-five miles from the Macaro Glacier at its head. It is joined at the bend, forty miles below the Macaro Glacier, by the Host, a small, unimportant stream coming from the pass of that name and for some unexplained reason giving its name to the main river from the junction to the sea from the rakaia river to a point twenty miles down the landsborough valley the main chain practically rises above the snow line the whole way sending off long spurs or ranges on the east and more precipitous ones on the west the peaks themselves gradually become higher till in mount tasman eleven thousand four hundred and seventy five feet the divide reaches its highest point mount cook twelve thousand three hundred and forty nine feet being an offshoot of the main range and sending down all its drainage eastward into the waitaki south of mount tasman the peaks gradually become lower and the range assumes a rocky saw-toothed form sending up high rock peaks with low saddles between them which as the host pass is approached are uncovered by snow in the summer the host pass itself is the best transinsular route being only one thousand eight hundred feet above sea level below this pass there are again fine mountain groups rising to nearly ten thousand feet containing many magnificent ice-clad summits and glaciers of no small size. The principal of these are Aspiring, Lydia, Robinson, Ernslaw, the Ark, Castor, and Pollux, etc., all untouched from an alpine point of view, with the exception of Ernslaw, a fairly easy peak by all accounts, near Lake Wakatipu. A few miles south of Mount Sefton, 
which lies at the head of the Twain River, the Hooker Range branches off from the main divide and continues some forty or fifty miles south. This range is higher and carries far more perpetual snow and ice on it than the dividing range which runs parallel with it, for though the latter has many peaks rising to a considerable altitude, which would be covered with perpetual snow if situated a little north or south of their position, yet it is a noteworthy fact that here they are almost devoid of ice. The only reason I can give for this state of things is that the Hooker Range, being higher, cuts off the moist sea winds from the main range, thus causing a smaller annual snowfall. The principal glaciers and ice-clad peaks of the southern Alps lie between latitude 43 degrees and 45 degrees south, and in spite of the fact that this is nearer the equator than the Alps in Switzerland, the snow line is much lower here than in Europe, and our glaciers descend to lower limits. Taken as a whole, I consider that the perpetual snow line in these mountains lies between 6,000 and 6,500 feet, or nearly 3,000 feet lower than in Switzerland. I have seen one or two peaks off the main divide, which have snow on them all the summer, from 5,000 feet upwards, but these are exceptions caused by their shape and position. The glaciers descend to an extraordinarily low level. On the eastern side, the terminal face of the Tasman is only 2,354 feet above the sea, and the Muller and Hooker, 2,500 and 2,882 feet respectively. On the western side, this peculiarity is still more marked. The Franz Josef Glacier on the Waiho River has its terminal face in latitude south, 43 degrees, 25 minutes, 30 seconds and though it is within fourteen miles of the sea it lies only six hundred and ninety-two feet above sea level the fox glacier a few miles further south descends to within ten miles of the beach and to six hundred and seventy feet of sea level the balfour glacier at the head of the central branch of the cook river has its terminal face at an altitude of two thousand three hundred feet these facts at first sight appear to be extraordinary but I think they might be accounted for by the peculiar climatic conditions prevailing in New Zealand. The northerly and westerly winds, which so frequently come over the Tasman Sea, carry an immense amount of moisture, and within a few miles of the coast they meet with the great wall of the southern Alps. The consequence is a very heavy rainfall in some parts of the ranges, amounting probably to 140 inches in the year. Even at Hokitika, on the sea beach, the fall reaches 126 inches and it is far heavier in the mountains. This great rainfall, combined with the height of the mountain wall, which the wind meets, and which forces the moisture to a great altitude, no doubt produces a correspondingly heavy snowfall, and consequently low snow line. When the map of the Fox and Franz Joseph glaciers is examined, it is not difficult to account for the low altitude to which these two glaciers descend. They have immense neve basins, and only a narrow outlet for the ice flow, which being forced out in considerable bulk down narrow and steep valleys descends to a far lower altitude than those of the eastern side the franz joseph for instance descends over eight thousand feet in eight and one half miles a fall of more than nine hundred and forty one feet a mile on an average and from the lower neve to the terminal face the fall is still greater for scientific men there are several most interesting problems to solve and a great deal remains to be done by geologists, botanists, and others. Up to the present, only those who do not mind roughing it considerably have gone far afield. It is true that the main glaciers on the eastern side have been thoroughly explored, and parties have for some years made annual expeditions to the Tasman district, climbing a few peaks and making a pass here and there. But even on the eastern side of the southern Alps, especially north and south of the Tasman district, there is an immense amount of work to be done by alpine climbers. The details and general topography, however, of the eastern slopes of the central district are well known. On the western side, it is only during the last three years that the ranges in this locality have been explored and mapped, so far as minor detail and topography are concerned. The higher peaks, however, have for some years past been trigonometrically fixed by the survey department from the west coast a low country and it has fallen to the lot of mr c e douglas and myself to be the first to push up the rivers and glaciers and determine the details of the topography those districts lying at the head of the wataroa and wanganui rivers on the west and rakaia and rangatata on the east have practically been left alone by alpine men and as already stated 
the first two rivers named are almost wholly unknown in their upper valleys in the south there is work for years above the snow line on the virgin peaks of the aspiring group and also of the hooker range and unless more parties take up this most fascinating of all sports the completion of the work must be left to the next generation all the larger glaciers except those up the rakaia river have now been mapped and explored i know from personal experience every one of importance in the central portion of the southern alps with the exception of the spencer up the gallery river but many points of the greatest interest have still to be settled concerning their movement advance or retreat and also respecting the positions and effect of the large ancient glaciers on the formation of the ranges and valleys end of preface and chapter one chapter two of pioneer work in the alps of new zealand by arthur paul harper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan chapter two the tasman district tasman district mount cook first exploration of murchison glacier first ascent of harper saddle other climbs necessary conditions the only locality in the southern alps which has been in any way opened up for tourists is the tasman or mount cook district which includes the four large glaciers at the head of the tasman river and nearly all the finest peaks in the alps the leading features of this district have already been so ably and thoroughly described by the rev w s green dr von lindenfeld and mr g e mannering that i shall not dwell on the description of the scenery but shall only give a short record of my own and others work here which has materially added to our topographical knowledge of the district since von lindenfeld made his exploration of the tasman glacier note the high alps of new zealand by rev w s green macmillan der tasman gletscher und st ungeberg by von lindenfeld with axe and rope in the new zealand alps by g e mannering longmans the chief point of interest is mount cook twelve thousand three hundred and forty nine feet for some years past an attempt has been made amongst those who climb in new zealand to change the name of this peak to aurangi a maori word some of those who write articles on their climbs are fond of saying mount cook or to be correct aurangi or some such expression inferring that mount cook is not the correct name i have always objected to the innovation and have made inquiries in all directions but can find no proof whatever that aurangi was applied to the peak or that it ever had a distinctive name amongst the maoris so far as i could learn from the maoris of the west coast who could see mount cook and the other great peaks towering up within twenty miles they had no name for any peak or range except those lower hills on which they ventured again the maoris had a wholesome and deeply rooted fear of the mountains none of the old west coast natives ever went far from the low country so it can hardly have been necessary for them to have individual names for the great snowy range on the east coast the maoris could have had little knowledge of this district as it is so far inland and most of the south island natives lived near the sea beach from which mount cook is only in one or two places visible and can only be distinguished by persons well acquainted with the peak it therefore appears that if any maori name existed it would be known amongst the west coast natives who could see mount cook every clear day within twenty miles of the sea at the mouth of cook or weheka river while those natives who lived on the grey river and those settled at jackson's bay in the far south would be able to see it from nearly every part of the sea coast standing out in the most unmistakable manner in eighteen sixty five i had a maori of whom more will be said with me for two months and a very good intelligent fellow he was i asked him one day what does aurangi mean bill to which he answered it meant a big white cloud i said i suppose that is why you call mount cook aurangi oh no aurangi not mountain aurangi a big white cloud here there said bill pointing out sundry large fleecy clouds i then pressed him more on the point and told him he knew nothing about it and that aurangi was the name they had for mount cook but he waxed quite indignant saying to maori he no named mountains only where he go to white man he name em i afterwards made inquiries from other maoris and always had the same reply that they had no name for the high mountains it is not a matter of much importance 
but it will be a pity to have the older name of Mount Cook superseded by a Maori word which has only been applied to the peak during the present generation. The name Aorangi is no doubt a good one, and if it is considered advisable, there is no reason why it should not be adopted officially, but it is wrong to state that it is the proper name for the peak. Mount Cook is not on the main range, but lies on a ridge which branches off in a southerly direction from a point a little south of Mount Tasman. 11,475 feet. Note. See Appendix Note 2. End of note. This offshoot is about 12 miles long and includes some lower peaks of 6,000 and 7,000 feet, besides the three peaks of Mount Cook itself. On the western side, between it and the main chain, which here, after bending away to the west, turns again and runs parallel to Mount Cook for a short distance, the Hooker Glacier lies and on the eastern side the great Tasman Glacier passes along the foot, receiving supplies from the peak. The Hooker Glacier gives rise to a river of the same name, which runs in a southeastern direction along the foot of the Mount Cook Spur, to join the Tasman River some four or five miles below. A mile from the outflow of the glacier, the Hooker Stream passes, sometimes along and sometimes under, the terminal face of the Muller Glacier, which winds in a northerly direction under Mount Sefton and the other peaks of the main range. Near the terminal face of the latter glacier, the Hermitage Hotel was built in 1885, and from it parties of climbers are able to make a comfortable start on numerous expeditions. To the north of Mount Tasman, the main range continues in a northeasterly direction to Mount Ellie de Beaumont, 10,200 feet, a distance of 11 or 12 miles, after which it takes an abrupt turn to the east, to the Hochstetter Dome, 9,258 feet, and thence, again, it gradually assumes a northeasterly direction past the Godley district, to the head of the Rangitata, and so on. From a point a little east of the last-named peak, the magnificent Multibrun range of rocky peaks branches off to the south, running nearly parallel to the main range and Mount Cook, and with them enclosing the great Tasman Glacier, which takes its rise from the peaks of Elie de Beaumont and Hochstetter Dome. Still further eastwards, another and longer divergent ridge, the Liebig Range, branches from the main chain, running for a few miles in a due easterly direction, and then, sweeping sharply round, continues for twenty miles or more in a southwesterly direction. Between this range and the Malta Brun, the Murchison Glacier flows, having a saddle at its head, leading into the Tasman Glacier north of Mount Darwin, 9,715 feet. Another saddle over the main range into the Wimper Glacier on the west coast, and a third in near proximity over the Liebig Range to the Klassen Glacier, which lies at the head of the Godley River. The Murchison Glacier is the third in size of the New Zealand ice fields, and draws supplies chiefly from the Malta Brun Range. Between the latter range and the main range, the Tasman Glacier, eighteen miles in length, flows, receiving several large tributaries from the peaks of the Divide and Mount Cook. About six miles from the terminal face of the Tasman Glacier, at the inflow of the Ball Glacier, the government in 1891 built an iron hut, and formed a few tracks for the use of climbers, and from that date mountaineering may be said to have assumed a civilized form, for previously a start had to be made from the Hermitage Hotel, and camping necessaries had to be carried on our own shoulders over trackless moraines. Since the building of the hut, I have only been for two expeditions in this district, and, rough as the present arrangements are, as compared with Switzerland, they are luxurious when contrasted with our experience before 1891. Even now, in the Tasman, our best-known district, any expedition entails, for one not accustomed to it, a large amount of very hard work. We have no guides, and porters are difficult or almost impossible to get. The few men who have gone in for systematic work have had to learn the art of mountaineering without help, and necessarily at considerable risk. Consequently, we can boast of three or four climbers, who are almost first-class men, never having climbed with guides, and yet able to top some of our finest peaks. Alpine workers, especially in a new country like New Zealand, may be divided broadly into two classes, exploring climbers and climbers who wish only to top peaks. Of course, many do a little of both, but one class makes exploration its hobby, 
while the other cares for climbing only and is not particular about the topography or geography of the country often adding very little to our knowledge of the mountains of the two classes i think the explorer does the most useful work true he gets little credit for the hardships endured because after many weeks of hard work he can often only prove which routes to avoid and someone learning this important point appears on the scene with all his predecessor's knowledge thus saving days of reconnoitring and completes the climb or exploration on his return we hear the first man mentioned only as having failed at a certain place or having made such and such mistakes there being no acknowledgment of the benefit derived from those mistakes or of the time saved by making use of his experiences in another way too the first man has to take a second place he may in the course of his exploration bring information as to a likely pass the other makes the said pass and writes a glowing account of quote, first pass by so and so end quote, with no mention of the fact that mr explorer gave him the whole facts as to the route the result is that many who are better men with their pens than their axes gain great kudos while the really hard worker who has borne the brunt of the battle is unknown except to a few and has the misfortune of seeing the results of his work not only ignored but to a great extent appropriated by someone else in january eighteen ninety mr g e mannering and i made an expedition to this district originally with the intention of trying mount cook we formed our main camp on the site of green's fifth camp which was close to the point at which the bowl glacier joins the tasman some six miles above the terminal face the above-mentioned hut now stands on this site and has a horse track to it but in eighteen ninety no sort of track existed and we had to carry our heavy loads of from thirty to fifty pounds to the camp the route after reaching the terminal of the tasman glacier had to be taken along the bottom of the v-shaped valley formed on the left by the hillside and on the right by the large lateral moraine of the glacier in places this valley is broken or half filled up by large shingle fans from the hill and between these the bottom is filled with large boulders of ten feet or so in diameter which have fallen from the moraine or the hillside consequently our progress was painfully slow for we were always more or less in bad training at the commencement of our trip i remember that i used to think at the time that there could not possibly be any worse ground to travel over but my last two seasons work on the west coast rivers and glaciers have caused me to modify those ideals considerably yet from my knowledge of switzerland i can say without doubt that this district presents far greater difficulties on low ground than the former would present even before it had reached its present state of good tracks and huts but as compared with some west coast valleys it is easy country to travel over from our main camp we established a bivouac on the hochstetter spur near the one used by mr green in eighteen eighty two and from there intended to establish another on the lower snows of the linda glacier which flows down from the northern slopes of cook between it and mount tasman the weather looked threatening and i did not at all care to risk so high a sleeping place but after some discussion we went on and reached the glacier dome a rounded peak over which the route lay to the great ice plateau while climbing the last rocks and pulling our loads up after us one of the straps broke and the swag made a rapid descent for some seven hundred feet into a berkschrund this put an end to the plan of sleeping out on the linda glacier therefore after reaching the great ice plateau we made a return to the lower bivouac at six thousand five hundred feet the delay caused by the recovery of our lost load proved beneficial for a howling northwest gale sprang up that night and made us most uncomfortable what would have been almost fatal had it caught us at the proposed bivouac on the linda glacier some three thousand feet higher at daylight next morning the gale was so bad that we continued the descent and retired to our main camp having been so far successful that we could boast of being the first new zealanders to reach the snow plateau and glacier dome i had done a few climbs in switzerland in eighteen eighty seven and eighteen eighty eight and had therefore some slight idea of the work of mountaineering and was convinced that we had not yet had sufficient practice or experience to attempt such a difficult peak as mount cook consequently mannering much against his wish decided not to try the mountain again that year unless we could make up a stronger party 
This attempt was the only one I ever made on Mount Cook, but Mannering with Mr. H. Dixon again tried it the next season, and nearly succeeded in conquering it by the same route as that taken by Mr. Green in 1882. Note, quote, with axe and rope in the New Zealand Alps, end quote, by Mr. G. E. Mannering, Longman's, end of note. Instead of returning to the Hermitage by the usual route, we made the first pass over the Cook Range, via a saddle at the head of the Ball Glacier, 7,426 feet above sea level. It was an easy day's climb, and led us into the Hooker Glacier, about five and a half miles above the Hermitage, and has since become quite a favorite expedition for tourists, giving, as it does, good snow and ice work, combined with glorious views of the four great glaciers and the chief peaks surrounding them. Having replenished our supplies, and being joined by Mr. H. M. Hamilton, a tourist whom we met at the hotel, we returned on the ninth January to our main camp. It was decided to give up the idea of climbing Cook, and to spend the remainder of our holiday in exploring the Murchison Valley, which joins the Tasman Valley, just opposite our camp across the glacier. Though the terminal face of the Murchison Glacier has been seen for four miles distance from the lower portion of the Tasman Glacier, it had been up to that date entirely unexplored, and was supposed to take its rise from the southern slopes of Mount Darwin. We had no reason to suppose that this was not the case, but wished to make a personal exploration of the valley. Our plan was to proceed up the Murchison to the head and cross the Maltebrun range between Mount Maltebrun, 10,421 feet, and Mount Darwin, 9,715 feet, by the saddle which was supposed to be the head of the glacier, and return down the Tasman to our camp. We expected to be able to do this in one day, but on second thoughts decided to take a blanket and a day's provisions. Starting on January 10th at 9 a.m., with light loads of about 30 pounds, and crossing the Tasman, a distance of two and a half miles, in two hours we found ourselves in the river bed of the Murchison, which, after the bad surface moraine of the Tasman, proved good traveling. Every step opened up new glaciers and peaks, and we wasted some valuable time in deciding whether these peaks were unnamed or only new views of old friends, with the result that it was 3.30 before we reached the glacier. The ice was covered with debris even worse than the Tasman Glacier. It is difficult to give an adequate idea of these terrible moraines. They must be seen by anyone wishing to realize their extent and size. Imagine loose boulders of all shapes and sizes, up to 10 or 15 feet square, thrown into heaps and hummocks a hundred feet high, and in hopeless confusion, extending for miles, and a faint idea of what we had to travel over may be formed. With this sort of travelling, it may be supposed that progress was slow, and at five p.m. we had only gone a mile up the glacier. Here a tributary came in from the Malta Run Range, near which was some scrub for firewood, so we took advantage of such a convenient spot, and stopped for the night." So far nothing had happened to make us doubt that we should be able to cross the saddle at the head of the glacier and reach the Ball Glacier camp the next day. Therefore, we did not economize our food that evening or the next morning at our 5 a.m. breakfast. Two miles above our camp, the glacier appeared to come from the left, off the Malta Brun Range, but on reaching the spot and ascending a rise in the ice, we discovered that it was only a tributary stream and the main glacier lay in front of us, stretching out for miles, and evidently coming from the northern side of Darwin instead of the southern slopes. A short council of war, as to the advisability of continuing an expedition which must involve another night and day away from camp, with only enough food for one meal left, ended in our deciding to do or die. Consequently, we made for the white ice now just ahead of us, and began to move more easily and quickly. At 1.30 p.m. we saw to our joy a saddle of some 7,400 feet on our left front, which appeared to lead over the Malta Brun Range to the Tasman Glacier, at the head of a large tributary, the main glacier apparently coming from a saddle a mile or two further to the north. After some rather difficult work amongst snow-covered crevasses, and in a thick mist, we arrived on our saddle at 4.30 p.m. In a short time the fog lifted, and we were fairly puzzled to know where we had got to. No Tasman was in sight, 
but far below us an unknown glacier swept away to our right hand instead of to our left as we had anticipated suddenly mannering saw the hochstetter dome which he had ascended the previous season and then it all became evident instead of being on a pass over the Maltebrun range we had ascended a spur round which the murchison glacier came and the ice below us was the head of that glacier sweeping down to the right previous to turning at right angles round the spur on which we were some distance to our left we could see a saddle leading into the tasman hopelessly out of our reach and in front across the head of the murchison another saddle over the main range evidently leading into the Wimper Glacier, which lies at the head of a branch of the Wataroa River on the west coast. Our pass, therefore, only led us into the neve of the glacier, on which we had been for the last two days. Hamilton was somewhat out of training, and wanted to rest badly, so we took an hour's spell and made a rough map. Some time after 5.30 p.m. we began to retrace our steps, having left a record of the ascent of Starvation Saddle in a cairn, at eight p m we found a fair bivouac and supperless rolled ourselves in our blankets and were soon in the land of nod at daybreak after a miserably small meal which exhausted our supplies we moved off and in eight hours reached the head camp i having gone ahead to cook a meal for the others who arrived an hour later the result of this expedition was topographically important it proved that the murchison was a large glacier as far as was then known the second in size in New Zealand, also that instead of coming from Darwin's southern slopes, it came from the main range at a point two miles north of that peak, which is, as I have already explained, on the Multiprun range an offshoot of the divide. Therefore, the Murchison with a Tasman encloses the Multiprun range like a great island in a sea of ice. The government had this glacier surveyed during the next season and proved our topographical conclusions to be correct and also showed that our sketch map was practically right in all its features in the early part of the next season december eighteen ninety i formed a party consisting of messrs r blackiston w beadle and myself but owing to some terribly bad weather and heavy snow we did nothing till january except twice reach the bowl glacier and on each occasion being driven back by terrific storms the season was notable for one or two things only but all of them important in that year mr broderick government surveyor completed the survey of the district and mannering nearly succeeded in ascending mount cook in company with mr dixon a most plucky attempt and lastly our blackiston and i made the first complete traverse of the hooker glacier and ascent of the saddle at its head since called harper saddle eight thousand five hundred and eighty feet the upper basin of this glacier had never been visited though two or three attempts had been made to reach it, rendered unsuccessful by the enormous crevasses about five miles up the glacier. The previous three weeks' bad weather and heavy snow, however, had so covered the ice that I decided to make the ascent. On December 29th, Blackiston and I left the Hermitage with a light camp, which we pitched some two miles above the terminal face on the western side of the glacier. On the morning of the 30th, an unfortunately late start was made at 6.30, and after an hour or so on the lateral moraine we took to the snow-covered ice which rose in a succession of ice falls on which the snow was disagreeably soft thanks to the heavy fall we were able to cross all the broken ice but not without considerable care as some of the crevasses were of great width eight hours floundering above our knees in soft snow brought us to the foot of the saddle which lay at the top of an ice wall of two hundred and fifty feet rising very steeply to within sixty feet of the top a large bergschrund skirted the foot of this ice slope and delayed us a good deal as it was not easily negotiated i took the lead for blackiston was new to ice work and after cutting some one hundred and twenty steps we stood on the saddle i have never experienced in any other climb such difficulty in the way of step cutting for the first one hundred and eighty feet the slope was so steep that i had to lean my chest against the ice while cutting the next steps and could see blackiston below me by looking between my feet in new zealand there is the same trouble with fog as in switzerland that is to say it is very rare that a clear view can be obtained over the west coast 
after ten a m because a low dense bank of fog drifts in from the sea and fills the valleys only allowing of six thousand feet and upwards to be seen this is i imagine very much like the fog so often seen on the italian side of the alps the saddle led into the la perouse glacier at the head of the cook river on the west coast but we could see nothing of the valley owing to the fog which lay five hundred feet or so below us and which though we tried to descend prevented our completing a transalpine pass the day had been intensely hot which made it highly probable that several snow bridges would be gone and new crevasses exposed hence it was necessary to waste as little time as possible and to reach them before dusk at three thirty after leaving a record of the ascent we began to descend blackest and going first and both descending backwards the steadiness of my companion on this ice slope is beyond praise considering that this was his first expedition on ice or snow unfortunately also it was his last for he has never been free to climb since and we have lost a promising mountaineer opposite baker's saddle which lies south of mount stokes and leads into the copeland river on the west coast we found the crevasses very much exposed and bridges gone no less than ten had appeared which were invisible in the morning one crevasse we crossed on the snow by crawling was of great breadth i believe it was fully twenty-five feet wide so large and numerous are these that except early in the season i feel convinced a route up the hooker would be a most difficult thing to find at seven p m we regained our camp and next day in heavy rain retraced our steps to the hotel fearfully burnt and sore from the glare on the fresh snow this climb was topographically of importance and had we had a clear view over the west coast we could have answered some interesting questions which however i was able to decide two or three years later as will be seen in a future chapter the actual result was that the map of the hooker was proved incorrect as regards the head basin and the position of mount cook which had been placed on the main range as a matter of fact it is on the eastern side and sends no drainage on to the west coast at all mount cook branches off at mount dampier eleven thousand three hundred and twenty three feet which drops on one side into the linda glacier on another into the head basin of the hooker while its third side falls precipitously into the la perouse glacier on the west coast from dampier the main range goes to mount hicks or st david's dome ten thousand four hundred and ten feet and thence past harper's saddle eight thousand five hundred and eighty feet to stokes ten thousand one hundred and one feet whence it bends away sharply southwards to sefton ten thousand three hundred and fifty nine feet and mount burns eight thousand nine hundred and eighty four feet which lies at the head of the muller glacier though our climb finally settled the position of mount cook as being off the main range it is only fair to say that mr roberts of the westland survey department had practically decided the point and only wanted to have it confirmed by more sure evidence when sitting on the saddle i planned a route up mount cook which seemed to be far easier and more direct than that followed by mr green but unfortunately i never had an opportunity of attempting it however mr fife who also considered it the best route followed it when he made the first ascent of the peak on christmas day eighteen ninety four later on in the same season namely february eighteen ninety one mr p h johnson and i made another expedition to this district intending to climb de la beche nine thousand eight hundred and fifteen feet and the minarets ten thousand and fifty eight feet part of the same mountain unfortunately my companion fell ill and we did nothing for a week or more and then only made two small climbs namely a pass over the multibrun range the first climb done on that range and an attempt at Mount Seely, from which we were driven by a terrific northwest gale when near the top. The following summer I made three attempts at Mount de la Beche, but had the most extraordinary bad luck. The first attempt was in company with M. H. Hamilton, and we reached a point close under the main peak, some nine thousand feet above sea level, when my companion became helpless owing to sickness. I then returned and obtained Jack Adamson from the Hermitage, and with him reached the same point in such a gale of wind that we could not stand and two days later we again went for the peak when my mate was seized with a cramp in the stomach which forced us to return at eight a m within nine hundred feet of the summit 
the only fact worth recording with regard to these climbs is that i obtained the first photographs ever taken overlooking the main range i have the somewhat melancholy satisfaction of knowing that my route which lay up the rudolph glacier and up the rock face of the peak was the correct one fife who made the first descent of this mountain later wrote and told me he had followed my route and it presented no real difficulty mount de la beche is one of our most beautiful peaks and stands between the tasman glacier and the Kron prince rudolph glacier a large tributary flowing into the main glacier some twelve miles up at the point where these two ice streams join a deep triangular hollow is found bounded on two sides by the high lateral moraines of the two glaciers and on the third by de la beche this area is filled with large masses of rock and under one adamson and i built a first-rate shelter which is really as good as a hut forming a convenient point from which to ascend fifteen or twenty of our highest peaks for a really successful expedition in this district a party should be composed of four men who are willing to do a considerable amount of rough work and ready to carry their own loads they must also have plenty of time at their command as nearly all our old failures are due to want of time which prevented our waiting for good opportunities and compelled us to attempt all sorts of difficult expeditions in the face of doubtful weather there are only two parties who have done any extended work in this district in one season and both owe their success to having plenty of time at their disposal those of us who used to try and climb with only a short holiday always prophesied success to the first man who could spend a month or two at the hermitage and that prophecy turned out to be true in eighteen ninety three eighteen ninety four season fife spent a considerable time in the district and could afford to wait for his weather consequently he made the first ascents of three or four of our best peaks again in eighteen ninety four to eighteen ninety five season mr fitzgerald with his swiss guide zurbriggen had a successful season making several ascents and owing his success as much to the fact that he could await fine weather and good opportunities as to the fact that he had sir brigand to guide him fife's climbs were of course guideless and considering that he is like all of us a self-taught man they are greatly to his credit in fact so far as peaks are concerned his record exceeds that of any one who has climbed in new zealand for bona fide merit End of chapter 2「3. Of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 3. Westland. The West Coast of New Zealand. The Forest and Its Plants. Birds. In August 1893 I applied to and obtained work from the Westland Survey Department, in conjunction with Mr. C. E. Douglas, to continue the exploration and mapping of the rivers and glaciers with their surrounding ranges mr douglas had been working for some twenty years following and traversing rivers to their sources but none of the larger glaciers had been explored except the moraine-covered strontian on the copeland river and balfour glacier on the central branch of cook river this was owing to the want of a man experienced in ice work douglas having as a rule only carried his work to the snow line and having neither companion nor alpine equipment was unable to go into high altitudes before relating my own experiences amongst the westland glaciers and alps it will be as well to give a short description of the country this will allow my readers to form some idea of the conditions under which our work had to be carried on westland or west coast as it is more commonly called was rushed by gold diggers in the early sixties and a large amount of gold was found and exported now however it has become from a digging point of view a field of far less importance true there are still many working the alluvial ground but those making more than tucker are few and it is many years since a rise of importance has been made by any one the country itself except for a few clearings made by settlers may be said to be covered with dense evergreen bush forest up to three thousand feet above sea level which gradually merges into a low impenetrable scrub growing perhaps five hundred feet higher until it gives way to luxuriant snowgrass and other alpine plants there is a narrow strip of more or less flat country that is rough low hills 
with patches of actually flat land between the ranges and the sea varying from twenty five to five miles in width it is of little value from an agricultural or pastoral point of view covered as it is with bush forest and costing more than its value to clear here and there are large tracts of swampy ground useless to man or beast at present but which may prove valuable if properly drained these large swamps are usually to be found between the rivers on the flat country and with few exceptions confine the settlers to the river flats near the sea where the best land is to be found to a casual visitor there would seem to be in westland an inexhaustible amount of marketable timber both on the flat country and in the ranges the truth is however that beyond a certain amount on the low country there is very little in the ranges and up the rivers there is practically none of value and those trees which are worth cutting are so scattered that they would be unworkable by any mill fixed in one locality it is doubtful if the timber up the rivers will be more than sufficient to build and keep in repair culverts and bridges when such are constructed on the arawata and blue rivers in the far south of the country there is a very fine patch of birch really a beech bush which could be worked with advantage from one centre douglas speaks of trees forty-two feet in circumference with a clean trunk of ninety feet to the lowest limb growing on the arawata at present however the means of communication with the rest of the colony are very poor a fact which adds greatly to the difficulty of making either farming or any other industry remunerative the gold industry is the mainstay of the southern part of westland and there is little doubt that should the output of the precious metal cease there would be small inducement for a population to stay in the district a few possibly who prefer a free and unfettered existence in a part of the colony where they can easily make a small living may consent to dwell in such an out-of-the-way locality it is however more than probable that the minerals of westland will continue to give employment to some number especially when better means of communication are provided which will allow them to be worked at less cost with more chance of profit the only connection with the rest of the colony is by steamer and coach while south of ross the communication is precarious to say the least only a pack-horse mail running at present in my opinion westland has a great future before it if properly and energetically pushed as a tourist resort nowhere else in new zealand is there such magnificent scenery equalling if not surpassing that of switzerland and norway in grandeur but it is out of reach of the ordinary tourist unless he is willing to rough it considerably while to see the finest views in the southern alps on this side days and weeks of hardship must be faced which would frighten most people before any noticeable benefit can be felt from tourists some steps must be taken to make means of transit easier at present owing to the unbridged state of the rivers and frequent rain there is great risk of loss of time by being stuck up by floods but until we have a large neighbouring population a government would hardly be justified in going to great expense in making roads and bridges the bush note in new zealand the forest is always spoken of as bush as opposed to lower growth vegetation which is called scrub end of note or forest of new zealand has often been described but even had nothing been said on the subject it would require a more gifted pen than mine to depict its beauties the fascination which it has over all those who see or work in it cannot be understood by one who has not experienced it i will not attempt to describe the innumerable beautiful ferns and mosses and the wonderful colouring of the bush which never cease to exercise their power over even the oldest hand if he has any love of fine effects when toiling through dense undergrowth cutting a track or carrying a heavy load i found time to enjoy the lovely effects and fairy-like scenes met with at every turn yet in spite of its many attractions it is a serious drawback to such work as ours or in fact to any which entails much travelling even the oldest bushman may find himself temporarily bushed but a good man can by use of common sense and coolness generally find his way out somewhere not necessarily at the place he wants to go to but at least to some locality from which he can easily reach habitation common sense is not unfortunately a strong point with some if we may judge by the frequent absurd actions of persons lost in the bush for half the year it is easy to build a shelter with bark and at all times with ferns while no one need be without a good fire unless of course he has no matches 
those who have in the past suffered from exposure have done so for want of a little thought but many when bushed seem to lose their reasoning powers for there are cases in which it has not occurred to men in such a plight to kindle a fire even though they have a plentiful supply of matches nor to try and snare a bird or eat some of the edible plants in the bush when suffering from hunger when however we hear that there have been men who on being lost in hilly country covered with timber have on reaching a river actually gone upstream in order to get into the low country it is hardly surprising that the misfortune of being bushed is often serious in its effects though there are several edible plants they are not very nourishing nor can i honestly say very nice however a hungry man must eat what he can get and i have often been glad of even a small feed of pica pica fern asplenium bulbiferum this is perhaps the best of our natural foods and the curled crozier-like shoot is quite passable when boiled for an hour in addition to this is the head of the young supplejack parsimcia albiflora a vine which grows in immense quantities up to nearly two thousand feet above sea level and is about as bad an obstacle to force a way through as i know the kihiki phraeacinetia banksii which grows on the lower hills near the sea wild parsley angelica geniculata spinach tetragonia expansa and root of the bracken fern terra sesculenta are also eatable in the low country that is below twelve hundred or two thousand feet the undergrowth in the bush is bad beyond descriptions especially where supplejacks and lawyers rubus australis abound for the benefit of those who have never been in new zealand it may be explained that a lawyer is a bramble which grows in very dense masses and is covered with small thorns it is so named because when once a man is unfortunate enough to get into its clutches he finds it hard to free himself these most obstructive plants are fortunately not found above fifteen hundred feet from sea level unless the hill has sea frontage besides the plants already mentioned as eatable there are others possessing valuable medicinal qualities the best known of these is perhaps the coromico a shrub belonging to the veronica tribe which makes a good tonic useful in cases of dysentery and has already been used to make a patent medicine a certain portion of the flax plant formium tenax has an effect opposite to the coromico for external use we have the gum of the miro pine podocarpus ferruginea the finest healing ointment for an open wound that i have ever used and a sure cure for warts the maoris often take the leaf of the pepper tree drimus axillaris and after chewing it apply it to a wound which it is said to heal very soon leaving a blue tattoo mark the leaf i think is more or less poisonous and should be avoided like all those shrubs which have leaves with white undersides and dark above for camping purposes it would be difficult indeed to surpass the new zealand forest and in the mountain ranges of the west coast though we grumble at the work it involves we really have great cause to be thankful for it the eastern slopes of the southern alps are open and grass covered a great contrast to the densely timbered ranges of the west coast in the one district the want of firewood for camping purposes is felt and in the other too much timber gives a party a great deal of heavy work when travelling if it were possible to split the difference each side would be all that could be desired for explorations easy travelling combined with good camping grounds between october and march in the mountains within three thousand feet of sea level it is really not necessary to carry canvas unless of course one is fastidious as to shelter it is always possible to build a good fare or mai mai with bark stripped from the rata metrosideros robusta totra podocarpus totra or cedar libocedrus bidwillii trees all or some of which are to be found up the rivers of firewood there is such an inexhaustible supply and good variety to select from that it is always possible to keep a fire burning without any necessity to economize a great consideration in wet weather there is the rata tree the prince of firewoods very hard and burning almost like coal dry or green miki miki aki aki kamahi or so-called red birch white and black birches which are really beeches the mountain broom ribbon wood broadleaf totra and many others all burning in a green state though the first six or seven are the best and always available in the ranges while enumerating thus shortly the advantages and disadvantages of the bush i cannot pass over one of the greatest charms of camp life and work in unexplored country namely 
the birds to whom man is a stranger they are not only useful as food and enable two of us to do work which really required four men but they provide us with endless amusement when together and are especially welcome when one is working or camping alone first and foremost of these is the weka osidromus australis wood hen or maori hen as he is variously called as good a camp companion as one could wish for with his tameness impudence and almost human power of expression i have never studied a weka in or near civilization but as found in the hitherto unvisited valleys in which my last two years have chiefly been spent he is only approached by the kia or mountain parrot as a source of amusement and interest often douglas and i have sighed for the powers of the artist whose zigzags at the zoo in the strand magazine helped many a wet day to pass wherewith to depict the many knowing expressions of the weka and kia perhaps it is almost unnecessary to say that the weka is a bird with small unformed wings unable to fly and varying in size from a partridge to a pheasant in plumage he is not unlike the former sometimes dark brown and sometimes a very light colour according to whether his habitation is in narrow and gloomy valleys or open grass country he walks with a very genteel step and bobs his short tail up spasmodically his whole action suggesting the exaggerated motions of a teacher of deportment if such a person exists outside novels the male and female only keep together during the breeding season and if the place they choose for their temporary abode happens to be productive of the necessaries of weka life the cock drives his mate and family away at the end of the season remaining in solitary possession of a good feeding ground should however the locality be indifferently productive mr weka bids the family a glad farewell on completion of his domestic duties and seeks happier hunting grounds for himself as to food he is omnivorous eating everything from a pea-rifle cartridge to the remains of one of his own tribe or even family i remember an instance of this when our dog unfortunately killed a young bird before we could prevent it which was too small to eat the parents made a decent show of grief over their loss and then being quite sure that the little one was dead they proceeded to eat its still warm remains in camp the birds are useful as scavengers but they are incorrigible thieves trying to take away everything at all white or glittering and as they are able to move a weight of two or three pounds it can well be imagined that a careful lookout has to be kept the glance of mingled triumph and contempt which a weka gives over his shoulder as he walks off with your pipe is inimitable and his whole attitude would make a most laughable picture if well drawn one of these birds will take full possession of a camp as soon as he discovers it generally within a few hours of its being pitched and rarely have we been without one or a pair no other birds or rats are allowed to come near if he can help it but are attacked without hesitation and if another weka dares to intrude the one in possession will nine times out of ten manage to make good his claim though sometimes the combatants seem very unevenly matched for a fight possession is nine points of the law they even rush wildly at a thrush or crow though far out of reach above them and often resort to stratagem to induce the object of their attack to come within reach i have seen a weka run under a shrub on which a thrush was sitting and try to frighten him this had no effect so our friend walked away out of sight and in a few minutes returned and when he had come under the thrush he suddenly tumbled down and with stiffened limbs and ruffled feathers feigned to be dead it was a fine piece of acting but he had one wicked little eye open the thrush looked at the motionless weka for a second or two and then began to sing as much as to say i've played this game before leaving our friend to get up and try not to look foolish the thrush never seems to fall into the trap the weka though very clever in carrying out his scheme sometimes tries it on two or three times in succession which shows some want of intelligence for downright impudence too the weka is unequalled and no doubt this fact will help to preserve him against his new foe the weasel so kindly turned loose by a paternal or shall i say maternal government though really no match for such an antagonist he will by mere bluff frighten it for if he sees the weasel first he will charge it though i fear if vice versa he will run away the weka will figure often in these pages so for the present we will leave him the robin miro albifrons 
is a constant companion in some localities, as far as the bush limit. He differs from his English namesake very little, only having a yellow instead of a red breast. They are quite tame and generally called dear gentle little things, but in reality they are the most vicious and quarrelsome little birds it is possible to imagine. A family of four or five seem to spend their whole time in fighting, a great contrast to the Weka family. When one is cutting or climbing through the bush, a robin nearly always follows close behind, picking up grubs exposed in the footsteps and depositing them under moss or in holes in a tree for future use. Of songbirds we find a great number in the back country, away from the haunts of men, notably the crow, Glaucopus cinerea, which has a note like a rich-toned flagellet, the most beautiful bird I have heard in our ranges. Besides him are the bellbirds, mentioned by Captain Cook, and getting very scarce. The tui, canary, and many others, all of which swell the chorus, heard every morning and evening. The canaries, orthonyx or crocephala, and the little mountain wrens, Xenicus filviventris, are useful as foretellers of weather, for they always collect in flocks and keep up a lively chirping some hours before an approaching storm, a warning which we never allow to pass unnoticed. For the camp pot there is a varied choice. The weka is perhaps the most nourishing, having a large amount of oil when in good condition. Over a quarter of a pint can be obtained from a fat bird, which, though not very palatable, is sustaining and can be baked with flour to advantage. The kiwi is passable when one is hungry, though personally I do not like him, but being more nutritious than savoury, it is not to be despised, and is almost nice when boiled with piki piki fern and rice. The kiwi is a wingless bird, and still fairly plentiful in out-of-the-way places, but on the whole is fast becoming extinct. The west coast kiwi, Apteryx oani, is a small grey bird, differing from the North Island species, Apteryx mantelli, which is dark brown and more coarsely made. With the help of a good dog, they can generally be caught asleep in the daytime, being entirely night birds. Sometimes in the spring, one or generally two eggs are to be found with a pair in their retreat, but chiefly owing to cats and weasels, there are more solitary birds than originally. The only way to account for this is that, owing to the unknown enemy which has appeared, they become frightened and are unwilling to pair. Quote, and, end quote, to quote Mr. Douglas, quote, Mrs. Kiwi probably says, what is the good of my laying that awful egg if a weasel sucks it while we are actually sitting on it? End quote. The size of the egg is well known, and it is hard to believe that so small a bird can lay one so large. However, not one but generally two are produced. Both birds sit to hatch this, which is nearly as large as a black swan's egg. Note. See Appendix. Note 3. End of note for one could not possibly cover it alone, and there is little doubt that the warmth of decayed vegetable matter contributes largely to the hatching. Though laying two eggs, they only hatch one, and I have heard it suggested that the second is laid later and used to feed the young one, for though there is only one young bird, there are generally the remains of two eggs, and two are frequently found before hatching. During the daytime they sleep in a standing position, with their heads tucked down between their legs, looking like a fluffy ball on two sticks. When taking a kiwi from its hole, great care must be observed if the skin is required for stuffing, for while the body is warm the feathers or hair fall out, in handsful, wherever they are touched, but after it is cold it is the hardest bird to pluck I know. The caca, Nestor meridionalis, cacapo, stringops habruptilis, and kia, Nestor notabilis, of the parrot tribe, the wood pigeon, blue, grey, and paradise ducks, are all excellent for eating and if one is hard pushed for food, the smaller birds, such as the crow, tui, parakeet, and saddlebacks, are all acceptable. The kakapo is found in South Westland, the Sounds country of Otago, and the Nelson province. He is rarely, if ever, seen away from the birch forests. He is a large ground parrot, with a bright green plumage, and, except for descending from a rock or bluff thirty feet in height, his wings are useless to him. Like the kiwi, he is a night bird, living in holes and under rocks all day. As food, he comes second only to the weka, having a large quantity of fine oil in his body, of a light straw color. We capture him with the help of our dog, and he shows a great deal of fight before he surrenders. This bird apparently performs an operation on his food, akin to chewing the cud, that is, 
he collects a large amount of grass in his crop and retires to his refuge to chew it and when all the juice has been extracted he throws the grass out in dry bowls after feeding these birds make a booming noise not unlike the grunt of a pig and though it can be heard for a great distance it is quite impossible to locate it probably the fact of the bird being in a hole will account for the deceptive nature of the sound i have heard the noise apparently within a few yards of me and have been surprised and angry at the dog not looking for the bird where i pointed but instead of doing so he has run off up the hillside for some considerable distance and in a few moments the shrieking of the bird and barking of the dog will show that the noise had deceived me completely the crop of a kakapo when freshly killed makes a capital poultice if applied to a sore drawing out all poisonous matter quickly and effectually so the maoris say though one of our largest birds it has an egg not much bigger than of a pigeon a great contrast to the enormous egg produced by such a small bird as the grey kiwi it would be both reasonable and convenient i should imagine if they could change eggs blue or mountain ducks nestor rotabilis are not now found in any numbers except in the upper parts of hitherto unvisited rivers and make a very welcome addition to our supplies which are generally at a somewhat low ebb by the time we reach the head of a river they appear to have the rivers and creeks marked off in regular divisions never encroaching on the preserves of another or allowing intrusion by a strange couple i have seen many instances of this rule of division and proved it by driving two or three pairs downstream with their broods and finding them all in their own claims next morning many a fight can be seen between two pairs when a strange couple try to jump a claim their chief weapon of attack is a horny growth on the second joint of the wing unlike most new zealand birds the male and female are partners all the year round but the female alone sits on the eggs while the male keeps guard and feeds her the paradise duck casarca variegata is too much like a tough goose in my opinion but the flappers or young ones are very good indeed when roasted here again we find a peculiarity these ducks will sometimes build their nest in a tree thirty feet from the ground but by what means they bring their young ones to terra firma or water i cannot say possibly they carry them on their backs but if they follow the usual happy-go-lucky laws of nature in new zealand it is as likely as not that the promising brood is allowed to tumble out one by one and trust to providence scientific descriptions and names of our birds can be found in sir walter buller's birds of new zealand the above short description is not intended by any means to be complete for that would be unnecessary but certain interesting habits of the birds can be noted by those who see them in their undisturbed and natural haunts which scientists may not have been able to obtain having had few opportunities to go far from civilization it is a sad fact that most of the native birds of the country are gradually disappearing in the early days those who went into unknown country found thousands of birds of all kinds but now even in localities hitherto unvisited by man birds are scarce sometimes of course they are as numerous as formerly but i have been into valleys where hardly a bird was to be seen of any kind this is largely due to cats and weasels the digger is very fond of his cat and nearly always carries one with him but in the past when new rushes were frequent he would go off at a moment's notice from his camp or hut and if the cat was not at hand it was left behind and naturally became wild these have increased and multiplied enormously and i have seen their tracks miles up unexplored valleys it has been several years since the coast was overrun by wild cats and now weasels are added to the list of enemies which the birds have to contend against it is therefore only a question of time before our most interesting birds those that cannot fly become extinct the government has widely set apart two large islands on which to preserve birds and plants and they seem to be answering their purpose these are little barrier island in the north near auckland and resolution island near the sounds in the southwest no doubt in the unexplored country behind the sounds there are still plenty of birds but there again it is only a matter of time before they are exterminated though there are wild dogs escaped from civilization they are in no great numbers as a wild life does not seem to suit them and they soon die out end of chapter three chapter four of pioneer work in the alps of new zealand by arthur paul harper 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 4. The Waiho River. Franz Joseph Glacier. Journey Southwards. Waiho River. Lake Maporica. Terminal Face. Camp 1. Attempts on Glacier. Hot Springs. Camp 2. Camp 3. Icefall. Baffled. Return. On the 6th October, 1893, Mr. C. E. Douglas and I left Hokitika with instructions to map Lake Ianthi, some forty miles south along the road, and thence traverse the Wanganui River to the sea from the ferry on the road, after which we had to make our way further south to the Waiho River and explore the Franz Joseph Glacier. A daily coach runs to Ross, a small mining township of five hundred inhabitants, twenty miles from Hokitika, and thence there is a weekly pack-horse mail service to Gillespie's Beach. 88 miles south of Ross, and near the mouth of Cook River. We therefore put our small supply of clothing on the coach as far as Ross, and here obtained three weeks' stores and a pack-horse to carry them to Lake Ianthi. It took us to the 20th to finish our work on the lake, and on the 22nd we started in a small dugout or canoe hollowed out of a tree down the outlet which flowed into the Wanganui River, and on the 24th went down the river to the sea, having some very narrow escapes in the foaming rapids. Our craft was only six feet by two feet, and very clumsily made, so we had a good deal to be thankful for in getting down safely. It was largely due to luck, helped by Douglas's steering. Next day we returned on foot to our camp, some seven miles up the river, and thence carried our impedimenta five miles on to Hendy's Ferry, which is on the main south track, thirty miles south of Ross. This road, after leaving Ross, skirts along the foot of the hills, and crosses the Wanganui at Hendy's Ferry, 30 miles, the Wataroa River at Gunn's Ferry, 50 miles, branches off to Lake Mapurica on the left hand, and Ocorito, 64 miles from Ross, on the right hand side. From the latter place, which lies on the sea beach, the road is non-existent, and it is just possible to take a wheeled vehicle to that point the journey occupying about three days from Hokitika. From Hendy's Ferry, where we slept, we carried our loads and tramped guns on the Wataroa, and on the 20th of October went on to the Miner's Rest at the Forks, a settlement at the point where the road branches. The Forks is a township which can boast of a public house and one digger's hut, though in old days it had a large population when plenty of gold was being obtained there. Now, however, only two or three parties are working near it, and, on mail night especially, the whole neighboring population, of perhaps ten, assemble at the miners' rest. I am sorry to say they do not confine themselves to tea. On these occasions politics form the chief topic of conversation, because numbers of diggers, having Hansard's parliamentary reports sent to them gratis, and religiously reading every word, are keen politicians. I cannot conceive anyone wading through these reports for when it is remembered that there are some members in the house who speak for no other reason than to see themselves or for their constituents to see them in hansard it can be imagined what sort of reading they afford one evening when we were waiting for pack horses to take our stores as far as possible up the waiho river i became involved in a political discussion one of the diggers charged me with being a capitalist how can i be a capitalist when i've no money i answered Money, he explained, has nothing to do with it. I remonstrated. He said, Well, I don't know about your money, but you speak like a capitalist. I again objected that I could hardly be called a capitalist if I had no capital. So he changed his ground and said, Well, you're a conservative anyway. Being of opinion that there were no conservatives in this colony, and objecting to the expression, I thought this a good opportunity to find out what politicians meant by it. So I replied, Ah, uh, yes, I may be a conservative, but you must tell me what a conservative is before I can answer. A conservative, he said hesitatingly, is, er, is a man you don't agree with. I always suspected this to be the truth of the matter, for each party generally dubs itself the great liberal party, which I suppose implies that the other side are conservatives. On the 31st we obtained two horses and went on towards Franz Joseph Glacier. About three miles from the Forks is Maparika Township, which consists of a store and a public house, with a small population of ten or twenty diggers. Here we procured our necessaries. 
a horse can be taken right up to the terminal face of the glacier, so there was no need to procure all our stores at once. We therefore only ordered enough for a month or six weeks, for we might perhaps finish our work in that time, if favoured with fine weather, and if not, could easily have more sent up. After leaving the township, the road, or horse track, skirts the beautiful Maparico Lake, and many lovely views are to be seen through openings in the bush. To see this lake to advantage, it is necessary to stay a day or two at the township, and hire a boat. I camped on a promontory, halfway up the lake, for a week, in January 1894, when surveying it, at the time of the full moon, and the views day and night, were glorious. At the southern end, the snowy peaks of the Bismarck Range tower into the sky, with Mounts Cook and Tasman just appearing over them and at a distance of nine miles the franz joseph glacier is seen coming out of the valley between bush-clad hills and apparently pushing its way into the bush at the head of the lake in the foreground are numerous promontories with great trees overhanging and reflecting in the perfectly still water or perhaps the limb of some fallen giant stands naked out of the placid surface of the lake after my day's work i used to get into my boat and drift about on the lake smoking the pipe of contentment, and watching the last rays of the sun, throwing a pink glow over the great snow peaks, and the gloom gradually deepening over the glacier and lower valleys. Then the moon would rise, and shed its white light over the whole scene, and make me loth to return to my camp in the bush, with its mosquitoes. About eight miles from Maparica Township, after leaving the lake, the track passes a farm on the river flats of the Totra and Waiho rivers, on which sheep and cattle are grazed, and which is one of the few farms in the south where more than a living can be made. This is chiefly owing to the fairly large number of diggers in the district. The homestead is only a small house, but it is surrounded by a few acres of cleared land laid down in grass, and forms a pleasing contrast to the sombre-coloured bush and hills behind. Crossing the Totara River, the track continues for two miles to the Waiho River, where some four or five parties are gold-digging and have their huts, one of them Mr. Jim Nisbet, having been there for over twenty years. His hut is on the north side of the river, just below where the left-hand branch, or Callery River, joins the glacier branch, or Waiho. From Nisbet's hut, a small foot-track runs along the bank of the former river for half a mile to a wire-suspension footbridge, which spans the stream some fifty feet above the water, at the mouth of a magnificent gorge. This is one of the finest gorges I know, within easy reach of tourists. The river is a large glacier-fed stream, and descends very rapidly through a deep and narrow rocky gorge, above which the mountains rise abruptly, to the height of three thousand or four thousand feet. The contrast of dark green bush on the almost precipitous hillsides, with the grey rock walls of the gorge, rising one hundred feet sheer and overhanging out of the river, which comes boiling and roaring down over immense boulders, is very grand, while in the distance between the bush-clad hills can be seen the glaciers of Drummond's Peak, some miles up the Callery River. On the small level piece of ground, between the two branches, and at the foot of a rounded hill, the Doughboy, there's a digger's hut called the Hospital, and a few chains further on, the bank of the glacier, or right-hand branch, are some hot springs, of which more will be said. The county council bought this hut for the use of tourists and others who visited the hot springs, but as only one or two come in the year, Andrew Gordon and A. Woodham, working a claim close by, had taken possession. By the hot springs, another footbridge spanned the glacier branch, but that was swept away in February, 1894, by a flood. However, we used it constantly while there. The government are now building another across the Waiho, below the junction of the two rivers, from Nesbitt's hut to the south bank, and have formed a fair horse track to the terminal face of the glacier. After crossing the second footbridge, we had only one and one half miles to go to the spot chosen for our head camp, which we pitched on November 1st, in some tall scrub within four hundred yards of the glacier. To this point numerous persons had been in the past, but the glacier and the upper valley had not been touched, presumably because no one having any knowledge of ice craft had been there. Our camp has not yet been described, and, as it is the simplest and best form of shelter for a party of two, working in rough country and near forest or scrub, an exact description of it may prove useful. It is an invention of Douglas's, 
and we call it a bat wing. In the ordinary course of camp life, survey parties can have their loads packed on horseback and carry tent and fly with a second smaller fly to pitch at the end of the tent to shelter the fire. We, however, have to carry all our goods and chattels on our backs and over very rough, unexplored country, so could not afford to take such a weighty camp. We therefore pitch an ordinary six-foot by eight-foot canvas tent on a ridge pole with an eight-foot by ten-foot fly, six inches above it, and cut the tent in half along the ridge, and taking away one half, leave the other standing. This is just large enough to allow two men to lie heads and tails. The front or side is left open, and one side of the fly, which was over the half taken away, is raised about four feet in the middle, and the two corners slightly less. Under this the fire burns about three feet away from the remaining half of the tent, so that in wet weather we have shelter for ourselves and fire, and save more than half the weight, and though rather cramped for room, are fairly comfortable. Should a heavy gale of wind make the shelter too cold, or cause discomfort by blowing the smoke into the bat wing, we make a break wind of ferns or branches across in front to protect us. We never have more than this to cover us, and often when necessary to travel in light order, trust to finding some friendly rock to sleep under, or build a mai mai with bark and ferns. Our stores arrived by pack horse next day from Maporica, a ford rather below Nesbit's hut, having been found for the horses. Having made ourselves fairly comfortable and ready for a long stay, I spent the afternoon in looking about the terminal face and reconnoitering to determine our best mode of attacking the very rough glacier in front of us. The exact position of the terminal face of the Franz Joseph Glacier is lat south, 43 degrees, 25 minutes, 30 seconds, long, east, 170 degrees, 10 minutes, 58 seconds, or rather nearer the equator than Florence in Italy. It comes down to within 14 miles of the sea, to an altitude of only 692 feet above sea level. It is about half a mile broad, and showed an upper layer of white ice pushing its way over a lower layer, which carried dirt and stones. There are five isolated roches moutonnées standing at intervals across the valley at the terminal face. On the right-hand side is the Sentinel Rock, 236 feet high, the largest. A few feet to the left comes the Müller Rock, 60 feet high. The Strontian Rock lies nearly three chains further to the left and is about 160 feet high. And lastly, the Barren Rock, 50 feet in height, lies near the river, which flowed out on the extreme left or east side of the glacier. Behind the Sentinel Rock, with the ice still pressing against it, is a rock, since named the Harper Rock, about 170 feet in height, with some moraine debris on its summit, which must have been deposited within the last few years, as no moss or vegetation was to be seen there. Some eight chains to the left, and still surrounded by ice, the Park Rock, 190 feet, lies behind the Strontian, and is raked by a running fusillade of falling ice from the towering pinnacles behind. For the purpose of understanding this interesting array of rocks across the valley, reference can be made to the sketch plan of the terminal face of Franz Joseph Glacier, given in Chapter 11. The best point from which to get a general idea of the valley in Glacier is the Sentinel Rock, and thither I went as soon as possible to form a plan of attack. The glacier being in such warm latitude and low altitude, and having such a rapid descent, is naturally very much broken and crevassed. From the Sentinel the great icefall can be seen at a distance of two and three quarters miles, descending in a little over a mile, 1,800 feet. Even from such a distance it presents a grand appearance. Below it the glacier sweeps round a slight bend and comes straight down in gigantic waves to the terminal face. There are evidently rocks of the same kind as those exposed at the snout, under the ice for some way up the valley, as the glacier has the appearance of heaving or lurching from side to side on its way down between high rocky walls, which rise out of the ice. The idea conveyed to my mind was that of water forced at an angle into a narrow rocky channel, and forming waves which rebounded from one side to the other, obliquely, across the course of the stream. The extent and height of these waves, 
may be seen from some measurements taken just above Cape Defiance, assuming the south bank to be zero. The heights taken every 160 yards across the glacier were as follows. Zero, twenty-one, eighty, forty, ninety-five, fifty-five, one hundred and seventy-seven, two hundred and twenty-nine, and two hundred and five feet. The glacier flows from south to north, and after leaving the neve and coming down over the steep slope which forms the ice fall, it enters a narrow rock-bound valley of a little over half a mile in width. On the eastern or left-hand side, looking up, the rock slopes back for some two hundred to three hundred feet, and then disappears into luxuriant timber, which close the hills up to the usual limit. This rocky bank is cut here and there into deep gorges and bluffs by streams from the hills. On the western side the range rises abruptly out of the ice. For the first three hundred to five hundred feet, a bare, ice-worn precipice, fringed with scrub and bush, growing on almost precipitous hillsides, for some thousands of feet above. Here and there fine waterfalls drop over the cliffs into the ice. The surface of the glacier, contrary to the general rule with New Zealand glaciers, is practically clear of debris, with exception of a narrow strip along the western side coming from a patch of rocks near the head of the ice fall. This accumulates in the bend above Cape Defiance, a promontory of rock which obstructs the flow of ice on the western side about two miles up the glacier, and continues until it joins a larger piece of surface moraine about half a mile from the terminal face, evidently caused by a slip a year or two previous. The debris left by the slip will no doubt have fallen over the terminal face and entirely disappeared by the end of 1898. The very broken nature of the glacier is the real cause of its cleanliness and freedom from surface moraine. As the debris falls into crevasses and comes out at the terminal face in the lower layer of dirty ice. From the general appearance of the valley, it was evident that the best plan would be to cross the river and get on to the eastern bank, for the ice looked too rough for a practical route, and the western side was too precipitous to attempt. Accordingly, on November the 4th, after some heavy rain, I went across to the outlet and endeavoured without success to pass over the river on the glacier, while Douglas went down to Nesbitt's hut to bring up the remainder of our stores, which had been left there owing to a flood in the river. I found that the ice was very soft and broken all along the side, and that it was unsafe to attempt a landing on the bank near the terminal face. In fact, it was a decidedly difficult business to get up the sheer ice face onto the glacier. The only course left open to us was to try and force a way straight up the glacier. On the 7th we managed, after some gymnastic feats, to reach a point about one mile up the glacier on the western side, but the last 120 yards, having taken an hour amongst very bad seracs, we gave up the attempt and returned to camp. The following morning was spent in again trying to get over the river on the ice to the eastern bank, without success, and in the afternoon we went on to the glacier behind the sentinel rock, which appeared, from subsequent examination, to be the only possible route to reach the more level ice in the center. From this point we made our way up and across the glacier by slow degrees, crawling between crevasses and cutting steps up and down high and almost perpendicular hummocks, and after three hours were able to step ashore on the eastern bank about a mile from the terminal. For two or three hundred feet above the ice, the hillside is bare, ice-worn rock, sloping back at an angle of twenty-five degrees, and along this we went for a short distance until a deep gorge stopped us. As it was late, we decided to return to camp and move it up to a suitable place on this bank, at the same time bringing up a spare rope to fix at the gorge. We always take a dog with us to catch kiwis, etc., for food but as our work for some weeks would be on the ice, it was necessary to dispense with the dog's company. When I joined Douglas, I found he had an old friend, Betsy, a black, purebred mongrel, as he called her, and up to this point she had been a faithful, though somewhat useless, companion. Accordingly, while Douglas took her down to the beach for an old digger friend to look after her for a time, I went off to the small farm on the Totara River, obtained half a sheep, and returned to the hospital to sleep. Before returning to camp on the following day, I had a bathe 
in the hot springs on nearly every river on the west coast there are mineral hot springs their heat is not due in any way to volcanic agency and though i have tried to obtain an analysis of the water some accident has always happened and i have failed to get particulars it is generally the case that a mile or so before the river emerges from the hills a mineral spring is to be found in the bed of the stream in which case the water will be hot sometimes however the spring is a few feet above the river level and only warm the two best i know are those on the waiho a mile and a half below the glacier and on the fox river a mile from the fox glacier in each case they are situated in the river bed covered at flood time and often after the river has resumed its normal level they are completely buried in gravel on the flat near the hospital hot water can be found almost anywhere at the depth of six feet it would be warm at eight feet below the surface or on the edge of the river bed the temperature is one hundred and twenty degrees and at ten feet or two feet below the river bed the temperature is one hundred and thirty two degrees the hottest i obtained their rise and fall correspond with that of the river showing great activity when the latter is high in order to have a good bathe the plan was to take a long-handled shovel scoop out a hollow and letting it fill in with water lie down in it and stew if however the bath proves uncomfortably hot it is easy to let in a little ice water from the river a yard or two away or even catch a piece of floating ice and place it in the pool it was a new and pleasing sensation to lie in a hot spring under the shade of tree ferns and enjoy the glorious view of a glacier within a mile and a half ploughing its way down between steep hills clothed in luxuriant forest and backed by high snow and ice-clad peaks when going up a river there is no difficulty in locating these springs for their smell is strong and rather objectionable douglas said that quote, you smell as if you've been having tea with the evil one inside an old gasometer end quote, after having a bathe in one of them i cannot vouch for the correctness of the comparison as i have never had tea under such conditions but can quite imagine the combination would produce much the same effect on douglas's return we moved camp and some three weeks provisions across the glacier and along the eastern side to a point about a mile and a half up the valley and ascending four hundred feet up the ice-worn rocks found a capital camping place amongst great rata trees and alongside a clear stream of water which ran in a deep water-worn channel down to the glacier with many small pools in which to bathe situated as we were at camp two in fine rata bush with a luxuriant undergrowth of tree ferns and other plants which in england would be called semi-tropical vegetation it was difficult to believe that we were a mile and a half up and three hundred feet above a glacier through an opening in the trees in front of our batwing lofty snow-capped peaks could be seen a mile away across the valley rising in precipices from steep slopes clothed with dark green bush while below a pure white glacier flowed at our feet presenting as fine an instance of crevassed and broken ice as could be wished a near view of alpine peaks with a foreground of trees is of course met with in many places but it is doubtful whether the beautiful combination of tree ferns semi-tropical vegetation glacier and snow-clad mountains can be seen anywhere else except on the fox glacier from the rocky platform at the edge of the bush a few yards from the camp we overlooked the glacier flowing past in great broken waves down to the terminal face beyond which were glimpses of the river as it wound in and out of the old moraine hillocks covered with luxuriant timber to the large river flats below and fourteen miles away the blue sea was plainly visible with the white horses raised by a squall of wind one result of the neighbourhood of the ice is that alpine plants such as the nai-nai broom daisies and edelweiss are found growing amongst the vegetation of the low country i found one plant of the last named growing within eight hundred feet of sea level on the sentinel rock it does not appear to grow more luxuriantly at so low an altitude but on the whole is rather stunted finding the ice at the side of the glacier very rotten we attempted to continue along the side and succeeded in reaching a rocky cape 
which rose about a half a mile further up the valley. On ascending the point, we discovered that the rock side had lost its gentle slope, and rose out of the ice in a perpendicular face of several hundred feet, smooth and ice-worn. There was no route along here, so we returned, looking out for a place where we could cross the rough side ice and reach the more level surface in the centre of the glacier. The whole of the 16th was spent in trying to find a route onto the glacier. At seventy or eighty yards from the side, broad crevasses ran across and along the line of flow. Consequently, though the surface was fairly level, it was cut up into huge seracs and hummocks. After five unsuccessful attempts, we found a fairly good route, which, however, necessitated some peculiar acrobatic performances. Twice or thrice, I had to let Douglas down bodily into a crevasse, so that he could cut steps up to me, the side being too perpendicular to allow us to cut downwards in comfort, and then I had to cut steps up again on the other side for perhaps forty feet, using the axe with only one hand, and holding on to the ice with the other. No doubt, had the glacier been at a higher altitude, there would have been no difficulty in finding several routes, but here the ice was terribly rotten. Occasionally we would hear a report like a pistol shot, or louder, and feel a tremble under our feet, or see a large serac fall down, which looked strong enough to stand for days. Under these circumstances, therefore, we had to be most careful to choose a good line, because it had been decided to move camp again to Cape Defiance, a mile or so further up, on the opposite side, in order to have a good point from which to attack the great icefall and do our work on the neve. If weather came on and delayed us in the upper camp for a week, it would be possible that our retreat to camp too would be cut off by reason of the frequent changes in the surface ice. Having spent some days in survey work and wet weather, on the 22nd we each took 40-pound loads, including camera and instruments, and made for Cape Defiance, 2,864 feet. It occupied just an hour and a quarter to go some 200 yards before we reached the good travelling in the centre. When fossicking for this route the week previous, our gymnastic feats were most interesting and amusing, as we had only a camera to carry. But now, with our loads, we found it not only trying, but most difficult. The swags had to be lowered and pulled up again frequently, receiving very rough handling, regardless of their contents. The centre of the glacier was fairly good going for a short distance, and then we got amongst some bad crevasses again, with long narrow ridges between. Often after crawling along several of these razorbacks, we would find our way blocked by a break in the ridge, and be compelled to retrace our steps and try another line. Luckily, anticipating some such work as this, I had brought a bundle of leafy twigs of rata to stick into the ice and mark our route to save time on the return, because had we taken the wrong razor back at the start, we might have had an hour's work for nothing. Consequently, when we emerged from the rough ice close under Cape Defiance, there was a trail of rata twigs behind, which would ensure more speedy travel in the future. At Cape Defiance we found the only real piece of lateral moraine on the glacier, about eighteen chains long. This cape, or point, is formed by a spur, which projects across the flow of the glacier, and, narrowing the valley by a quarter of a mile, causes the ice to back up behind it to a considerable height. On the upper side of the spur, the lateral moraine lies at right angles to the general flow of the glacier, the ice having swept down into the bed, and then, turning in an eddy, flowed along and around the cape. In the valley formed by the moraine and hillside, we built a level floor of large stones, on which to place our batwing. Heavy rain had set in at noon, so we were fairly wet through and uncomfortable by the time we had pitched the camp. Behind us, the hillside had dense alpine scrub on it, and rose very steeply to the rocky pinnacles of Mount Moltke. To the right, a stream, quote, Harper's Creek, end quote, it has since been named, came down from the ice fields of the same peak. The valley down which this creek flows is very steep, and on the upper side has sheer rocky precipices, which are two thousand feet high near the glacier, and as the valley rises they gradually become lower, until at the head they are only some five hundred feet. Over this rock wall a waterfall, the Unser Fritz, descends in one leap one thousand 
209 feet being the drainage of the Andermatten and Baumann glaciers on Mount Rune. In front of us was the grand ice fall in all its glory, 1,800 feet or more in height and a mile wide, presenting a dazzling array of towering seracs and deep blue crevasses. I have seen many fine ice falls in Switzerland and New Zealand, but very much doubt if any, except perhaps the Haast glacier on the Tasman, is as grand as that of the Franz Joseph. Though I call it 1,800 feet in height, it may be said that for 3,000 feet at the least, the glacier is really an ice fall. On the 24th, we made an attempt to force a way to the Neve. After three hours, we reached the head of the ice fall by means of a fairly smooth strip of ice caused by the inflow of the Almer glacier on the left. It is generally the rule that where two glaciers join, the crevasses and seracs are much smaller than elsewhere. But after passing the junction, nothing could be done. The Neve snow was within a quarter of a mile, smooth and white, but between us was a field of ice broken into seracs and crevasses in a manner which it is impossible to conceive without seeing. Douglas said it looked like a bird's-eye view of an eastern town with a deep blue streak between each and every house. The seracs were all square and flat-topped, but surrounded by apparently bottomless crevasses. I could see that the only way to make a successful traverse up this glacier was in the early spring, when the winter snow would form bridges over this impossible piece of ice. It would only be waste of time to attempt to go any further, because nothing could be done without a ladder of at least twenty-five feet. It was also raining heavily, so we returned to camp, and spent the afternoon in making sundry observations, etc. On the following morning we went up the spur behind the camp, to five thousand feet or so, in order to get some compass shots into the upper basin of the Neve. From this point the outlook was splendid. Immediately on the right, across Harper's Creek, within a few chains, was the great Unser Fritz waterfall, with its two small glaciers and enormous precipices on each side. To the southeast we got a clear view for a short time into the main neve coming off Mount de la Beche, and the saddles leading into the Tasman Glacier. Opposite us we saw the Elmer Glacier, a fine open ice field coming off Stirling Rock, behind which Drummond's Peak showed a peculiar array of tooth-like rocks rising out of the field of snow. On the other side of this range lies the Callery River, which joins the Waiho by the hospital. Over the low country to the north, the view was good, but limited. The glacier to the terminal face lay two thousand feet below, at the foot of great precipices, over which a grand series of waterfalls fell, with a roar, into the ice. Beyond it lay Lake Mapurica, and the sea coast was easily visible to the Wateroa Bluff. The clouds, however, soon hid everything, and more heavy rain compelled our descent to camp. Next morning, in still bad weather, we retired down the glacier to camp too, having decided that no route lay up the ice to the Neve. The ice on the line of route had altered very much, even during the last three or four days, and had it not been for my rotted twigs left on the way up, we should have had hard work to find a way. Sometimes we would see a piece of rata thirty feet away and take a quarter of an hour to work round to it. The ice at the place where we had to leave the glacier was even more altered than elsewhere, and it was difficult to recognize the way which we had followed when getting on from the rocks. However, by lowering Douglas to cut steps once or twice, we were able to come off safely and reach camp too at 4 p.m., pretty wet and hungry. We now decided to try a high-level route along the top of the range, behind the camp, onto the Elmer Neve, and across it, over a shoulder of Stirling Rock, to the main Neve. This would involve a considerable amount of track-cutting, or blazing, in the dense bush and scrub, and probably with the bad weather we were having, would take some time. I therefore went to Camp 1, at the terminal face, and Douglas went on to the township at Maparica for more stores. Unfortunately, while there, he had a bad attack of influenza, lasting nearly three weeks, and so, beyond perfecting the survey and taking some observations of glacier motion, little could be done for the present. 
in naming the tributary glaciers and peaks which had not already received names from the low country trigonometrical stations we used those of swiss guides in almer cross bauman glaciers etc it is often hard to find names so we use those of one class for one valley and another class for another locality as far as possible end of chapter four